you know, someone told me that they read that the title was Geeks in Amplitude Estimation, which uh, you know, is not, not totally wrong. Um, it's also great to speak right after Toby Cubitt uh, talking about Hamiltonian simulation, because you might think that that doesn't apply to finance, but you'll see where that work actually slots in uh, as I get into the talk. So uh, let me just speak a bit briefly about our group and, and our approach, and especially the approach that I'm going to talk about in this talk. So we're working towards finding advantage in finance, how can we use quantum computers? And the way we do that is take well-specified mathematical problems, which finance has a lot of, and where we can calculate pretty well what the value of solving those problems faster will be. And then we ask, how good of a quantum computer do we need? What are the specs we need in order to do better? Uh, so there's some you know, advantages in finance, which is that the problems are well-specified, the value is pretty clear, but there are disadvantages, which is these are not obviously quantum native problems. So we attack this in a few ways. We do resource estimation, we do algorithm design, and then we look to integrate with hardware. And not just the hardware we have today, but importantly, the hardware we're hoping to have over the next decade, you know, as soon as we can get it. And we work closely with a lot of collaborators in industry, startups, and, and academia. So uh, I'll kind of summarize everything, you know, the takeaways from this talk in, in these next couple slides, but I'll do that by putting these resource estimates on a kind of landscape of quantum power. So on the x-axis, the number of qubits. On the y-axis, the depth of a program you'd want to run. And then crossing as equal potentials, the error rates. So 10 to the minus 3, I can run 1,000 operations on one qubit or one operation on 1,000 qubits. Oops. Um, so sort of the landscape looks a little bit like this. This is an artist interpretation here. I didn't take out my millimeters to put everything in exactly the right spot, but gives you kind of a sense of where we are today and where we want to go, um, including some you know, recent updates uh, and announcements. And there's more hardware, obviously, that could be on this chart. So last year, we looked at a problem that's very ubiquitous in finance um, and that would be very valuable to solve faster and better, and that's uh, derivative pricing, a particular kind of derivative pricing. Um, working with our collaborators at IBM, we were able to put that on this chart. And a recent paper from a few weeks ago allowed us to put another dot on this chart. So I sort of joke that our entire research program is putting dots on this chart and moving them down into the left. So this might look like a little bit of improvement. We switched the problem and saved some qubits, but it's bigger than you think. And that's because it's not just the number of qubits that matter and how many operations you need to run, but the required clock speed is also extremely important. It's sort of those three dimensions of uh, qubit number, operation number, and uh, required clock speed. So for derivative pricing, we had to estimate that you needed to run T gates at uh, logical, logical T gates at a rate of about 50 megahertz. It's a big ask. Uh, and one of the big improvements in switching to this other application is we were able to reduce that to about one megahertz. And it may be maybe a little bit better, as I'll describe. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the problem. So derivative pricing is about calculating expectation values of functions of stochastic processes. Uh, and we know that there's a quadratic speed up here. So let's say we've got some vector of values that describes, let's say, stock prices. Uh, and there's d of them at some time t. Then as we look over time, we'll have a series of these vectors at different times t up to some final time big T. And so that you know, might look like a bunch of these different paths where the price is in the, in the y-axis and the time is in the, is in the x-axis. So the, you can think of these as like stock prices over time. And importantly, these, this is not historical data. This is projecting forward. So you have some model for how you believe based on, it could come from a lot of different places, but you have some model for how you think prices will behave. And that's the stochastic process. So then you have another function which is called a payoff. So this is some contract that tells you uh, that you sell, that gives you some payoff depending on how the underlying stocks are going to behave. So a cl classic example is something called a European call option. And that says, um, you know, look at the stock prices at the final time, so big time t, compare them to some k value, and take the difference in the max compared to zero. So the max of that and zero is what you'll receive. So that's how much the contract is worth at the expiration time big t. But what you want to know is what's the price of that contract today if you're going to sell it or if you're going to buy it. Um, and so to do that, you need to calculate some expected value. So I need the expected value over all the different paths that these assets could take in time, what payoff I'm going to get. So that's sort of the derivative pricing problem in a nutshell. One important thing uh, to emphasize, though, is that 
Some of these are really easy already today, but some are hard. And the things that make it hard are, well, one thing that makes it harder is if you have a more complicated underlying stochastic process. That makes it harder to uh, calculate. Another is if you have a more complicated kind of payoff. And so this European call option we call a path-independent uh, payoff because it is only a function of the stock prices at the final time, big T. Ones we call path-dependent de ones actually depend on the value of the path uh, even at you know, sort of all times that we sample. So maybe we're looking at the average uh, of the stock price over some time window, or maybe we throw out paths that go above some barrier or something like that. They can get kind of uh, logically and combinatorially interesting. So classically, these ones that are path-dependent and harder to price are priced using Monte Carlo. It's, it's uh, high-dimensional Monte Carlo integration. Um, and you know, following on Ashley's work from, Ashley Mananar's work from 2015, we know we can, in most generic cases, get a quadratic speed up here using quantum amplitude estimation, kind of as the core subroutine. So we looked at this, and we actually picked some real derivatives that like my colleagues in global markets care about that are path dependent. They're not the hardest ones to price, but they're good examples. We looked at ones called autocallables, ones called tarfs. We constructed the actual oracle for doing the payoff logic and all the reversible arithmetic in there, uh, and came up with the estimates that gave us that, uh, you know, that initial dot on the quantum landscape power uh, chart. So I'm talking about the new, and there's more information in the uh, in the paper that's, that's at the bottom here. So the extension that came out a couple weeks ago is to look not just at the expectation value of prices, but also to look at the, I'm going to call it not the derivative, but the gradient, <laughs> just because we have the derivative of the derivative's price, which is always a little bit of a hassle. Um, but we want to take the gradient of that expectation value with respect to some theta parameters, which are the model that we use. So what this tells you is if you have some model for how the uh, derivative the underlying stocks are going to behave, and then you get some price, you want to know how sensitive that price is to changes in your model. And that's important for hedging risk. It's really like a core fundamental uh, part of our business and, and a lot of financial institution businesses. So a very simple example is one called the delta, and that's where you look at the rate of change of the price of the derivative with respect to the initial stock price at today's time. So how is this done in practice? Well, one way to do it is to use classical Monte Carlo to calculate the expectation value. And then you could use finite difference in order to calculate uh, the gradient. And so that's going to give you for, if you have k different, uh, different we call them different Greeks, k diff a k-dimensional gradient, and that'll go like k over epsilon cubed. If you use a, a kind of a heuristic, and a, not a heuristic, but a trick on top of that, uh, you can get that down. This is just classical, purely classical. You can get that down to k over epsilon squared. Um, and then sort of a, well, the first time I've seen this called a semi-classical method is in this paper by uh, Gillian et al. Um, but this is, we'll call it the semi-classical method. And so what you do is you price using our quantum derivative pricing, which gives you one over epsilon scaling. But then you just do finite difference of those inputs. And so that gives you k over epsilon scaling. But k here can sometimes be kind of big, maybe up to 1,000, or you, know, you could even imagine doing much larger. So there are quantum gradient algorithms in the literature. Can we use those to improve scaling with k? Uh, and the answer is yes, but you need to be careful with error scaling. Um, and that's what we start re really investigate in this paper, is how good might we hope to get by adopting these techniques. So broadly, how does this work? One of the first introductions of this is from Jordan in 2005. You have some function f, which uh, is a k-dimensional function for us. That's the pricing model for, the, for some derivative. And you need to construct a phase oracle like this. And then what you do is you evaluate this oracle in the exponent has you know, the, the value of the function f in the phase. So what we want to do to get the derivative is evaluate that oracle at, uh, in, in some hypercube of little differences around values for f of x. And if we do that, and we know that, let's see if this uh, pointer will work here. There we go. And we know that this is locally linear then we can pull out the initial value as a global phase, and we're left with the uh, first order gradient in the phase, and we can pull that out with quantum, uh, the quantum Fourier transform. It's a nice, neat little trick. Uh, well, a subset of the subgroup problem as well, it turns out. So uh, as is pointed out in, in this paper from a couple years ago, error scaling really matters here. Um, because even though this is going to give you a, now also, a, well, it's going to give you a quadratic speed up in k in the number of dimensions of the gradient that you want to take, you actually lose 
the advantage in epsilon if you do it naively using this phase um, oracle. And so they introduce a fix to this. And one of the fixes, well, the fix is to use a higher order oracle. Instead of just this one, f, you can look at higher, this is just a forward difference oracle, basically. I just move everything forward by some small delta to calculate the derivative. You can look at generalizations of like central difference and stuff and, and get sort of an nth order version of that. And the first order version would look something like this, where I go forward a little and back a little and, and, and average the two. Um, so this helps and recovers, basically recovers the theoretical scaling that we wanted if you use an oracle that has an mth order that goes something like this, where c is like a smoothness parameter of the function f, um, allows you to get back your, your square root of k over epsilon scaling, scaling, which is what we really want. So in comparison to derivative pricing, where we have only a quadratic improvement in the error, we now also get a quadratic improvement in the number of Greeks that we're trying to take. Um, I'll talk, what we then start to look at is how loose are these bounds and how can we do a little bit better in practice. Oh, and this is kind of the check-in with uh, Toby's talk. So um, in this paper, you build this nth order oracle using uh, block encoding and singular value transform based Hamiltonian simulation algorithm. Um, so not just for simulating fermions, but also for uh, gradients and derivatives. Uh, and, and one of the things we mentioned in our paper is we, there's, a new, there's a new work that drops the post-selection component of this and works a little better than that original paper. Okay, so we introduce a couple other, in addition to that one, a couple other little tricks um, to improve the quantum gradient algorithm in this setting. One is that we focus on the m equals one case and give an explicit construction where we just drop the block. We don't have to do block encoding. We don't have to do Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, we can use this circuit, which I don't have time to do in detail, but that saves a lot. And then we also introduce a maximum likelihood estimation at the end to try and improve um, how you're gonna actually estimate these gradients. And that, that also causes additional savings. So what estimate do we actually get? So we, look, uh, we wanna look numerically because we wanna compare two theoretical bounds. So we can't look at a huge problem, but we look at an example with four different Greeks on something called a basket option um, on three assets. And so what that option is, uh, is you, this is describing the payoff. So I have my stock price vector uh, or underlying vector at time t. I'm gonna take a weighted sum with some other vector, compare that to initial threshold and get that payoff, but only if this weighted average is above some barrier for all the times. So this is, a diff this is definitely path dependent. And so that means it doesn't have an analytic answer. So in these comparisons, the target benchmark we use is to do classical Monte Carlo and finite difference where we take just like a really large number of paths, a million paths. All right, so let's compare some algorithms. We'll start at the bottom. So uh, if we use classical Monte Carlo with finite difference, we need about 400,000 oracle calls. I mean, remember, so that, that's what tells us this is overkill to get kind of the exact answer for comparison. If we do common random numbers, we get down to 32,000. And if you were to just look at the approach from this paper all, with a few of the tweaks um, that we added, you would still require something like 200,000 oracle calls. And partly because you know, the required M is a little bit higher than you want. And we have to figure out what the smoothness value is in practice and, and, and all of that. Um, but numerically, it looks like this bound is pretty loose and, and loose by like orders of magnitude. So that's one thing we discovered. Another is, to look at the, the difference here, it's even if you do this, it's still worse than the semi-classical technique. And this is where you just do derivative pricing on a quantum computer and then do finite difference on top. But if we use this simulation-free quantum gradient method where we replace the uh, M order one using block encoding and Hamiltonian simulation with an explicit construction, we're able to drop it even further. So the reason this is only for, I, I mean, you might ask, the whole point of doing this is to try and get a better scaling in K, and you're only looking at a small K. Uh, we're just limited by what we can simulate today, but we're optimistic that um, some of this looseness will hold as K gets larger. And yeah, in, in the GAW algorithm, the main cost is Hamiltonian simulation, so Toby and I should keep talking. So when we summarize all that together, um, we, the best performing one is the simulation-free quantum gradient method on, on, on Greeks, and it comes to around you know, 6,000 logical qubits, 10 to the 8 T gates, and a T depth of about nine times 10 to the six. And so if we target about 10 seconds, this is where our 
sort of one megahertz target rate comes down. And hopefully, uh, you know, should the theoretical bounds of this remain loose um, as k increases, then this advantage would also increase. There's more subtleties here, too, that are talked about a little bit in the paper. So there's classical methods called automatic differentiation that also scale quite well um, with dimension. It's a little more subtle to compare. And in the paper, we talk about a quantum version of that, too. But the question is not entirely settled. We made some progress. All right, so just in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about one other uh, set of research that we've been doing, this time in, in collaboration with QCWare, um, on the main subroutine in derivative pricing and these gradient algorithms, which is amplitude estimation. So um, typically, uh, you know, if you're just doing normal classical Monte Carlo sampling, it requires one over epsilon scaling, and quantum or one over epsilon squared, classically, excuse me. Uh, quantum takes that to one over epsilon, so again, less samples. Um, and uh, textbook amplitude estimation also requires a depth of one over epsilon. So you could ask, if we want to give away some of the speed up, can we run shorter quantum programs? Uh, and the answer is yes. So uh, one of my colleagues looked at this uh, in, in, in the quantum counting setting. If you can partition the problem neatly, uh, then you can run it in parallel. And you can prove that up to log factors, this scaling is optimal. And then in recent work, we gave two other algorithms for doing this, even if you do not have some neat like, uh, a priori way to parallelize the problem. So it works generically. The first power law algorithm has a few spoonless assumptions that are still in there. Um, but for the second one, we're able to uh, prove performance. So this changes amplitude estimation from an all or nothing, like you can't run it until you can hit this certain depth, to something that's more of a smooth gradient of improvements. As you can run longer and longer depth, you should start to see more and more of the transition from 1 over epsilon squared scaling to 1 over epsilon scaling. And that means that it could act as a good benchmark. So it's not, you know, it's not a full system test like a quantum volume which run random, or other things that run random circuits, um, but it is a structured test for a problem where we, sh we should expect to see the advantage. So we, we ran this on one of IonQ's, uh, actually two of these are two charts, one from uh, one IonQ processor and one from another, uh, where the blue curve is just sampling classically, but, a, but we do that with a single, we build the oracle on a quantum computer, we sample it at depth one, and we uh, plot. So the x-axis here is the number of oracle calls. Um, this blue line is just this blue line stretched out, so you can see it a little more. Um, and see convergence uh, for error. We do this. It's for the problem example is constructing random four-dimensional vectors. So it's on four qubits, and uh, calculating their inner product with amplitude estimation. And we do that over 50 instances. So the orange curve is applying a version of amplitude estimation that's like this called maximum likelihood amplitude estimation, where, where, you, where you can start to have more control over what depths you go to to infer the, uh, the amplitude value. Um, on their higher generation QPU, we're able to push below the threshold. Now, this is not you know, comparing to classical, a classical CPU running this problem. That's a different thing. Uh, but it does give you some sense of uh, that we are getting something out of running longer depth quantum circuits. And these circuits are quite a bit longer than ones that um, we've run previously. So we run up to a depth seven amplitude estimation. So Grover Oracle is up to depth seven, which has about 90 two qubit gates in it. Um, so we're looking forward to this as a benchmark that can be run on all sorts of different hardware as one way to start to track uh, the performance of quantum computers improving on a subroutine that matters a lot. So to just summarize quickly, we're working backwards from to try and find defined advantage in concrete problems. Of course, we're optimistic that things will come up that we aren't able to prove today, but this is the, the approach we take now. And we're looking for partners and collaborators, in particular on improvements to relevant algorithms, especially looking at super quadratic ones. We're interested in alternative kinds of architectures that might have lower overhead for error correction or just for the algorithms themselves. And finally, this resource estimation is not easy, uh, and it would be great to do that with better tools. And so we're really excited to, uh, to have better tools, to do more of these resource estimates, so that we can produce better targets for everyone building hardware to start to work towards. Thank you. Thank you, Will. This uh, concludes our session, so the break is starting. However, if there is a quick question that we want on the record, please don't hesitate. We have one in the back. 
So can you go back to your slide 16, please? I can try. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this one. Uh, I'm curious, is there a particular reason you chose the uh, arrow to be less than 0 0.0625 and the failure probability to be less than 0 0.515? Uh, so. no, no, no special reason, really. We, we just needed some example. Yeah. Oh, okay. it, it's, it's kind of like order of magnitude. You're not trying to calculate. Often in practice, you're not calculating the Greeks to you know, 10 to the minus 7 accuracy or something like that. But it's oh. just, just an example, yeah. OK, OK. So if you uh, use some different numbers, you'll get the, almost the same or similar results. Yeah, well, if you try and if you set, the, if you set those numbers, you know, if you set the epsilon much smaller, then the quantum uh, algorithms will show much more advantage because they scale better with that. But in practice, this is you know, sort of the accuracy that people are, are looking for. Yeah. Great, let's thank Will again and uh, enjoy the break.